and I'm going to introduce to you uh, Stuart, uh, Stuart Carrington, who is a lecturer in St. Mary's and a referee, and um, the author of the ever Christmas friendly, uh, the refereeing, Psychology of Refereeing book. Um, and I thought, Stuart, it might be interesting to have you sort of kick us off tonight, because uh, well, I think referee abuse is quite an interesting um, thing to talk about on a psychological um, point, point, from a psychological point of view. And it's always amazing, isn't it, that people will feel that it's, they wouldn't shout at people in their office or when they're walking down the street or when they go shopping in Aldi. However, often on Saturday afternoon, people will quite happily shout at an individual during a football game and, and other sports as well. And um, so I thought it would be quite interesting to, to bring you in at this point, to have a little bit of a conversation about that side of things. Oh, perfect. Yeah, thanks, Simon, and welcome to everybody. And thanks for joining us tonight. I'll, I'll try and um, keep it as, as short as possible because I know that uh, you know your guests will want to listen to uh, all the more experienced officials here tonight. So keeping it short for me is normally quite a challenge, but I'll do my best. Um, it's a really timely conversation, uh, as Simon's already mentioned. You know, the, the, uh, the levels of reported abuse uh, just seem to increase every day, and we hear stories um, and. You know, some kind of very run of the mill and some quite shocking regarding referee abuse. Um, the interesting thing is it's not a particularly novel subject. So referee abuse uh, has a long history. Um, essentially, it goes back to, to the professionalization of the game uh, in the late 1800s. Um, and when we talk about referee abuse, particularly from a psychological point of view, I think we kind of want to approach it in a two pronged way. So when I say that, what I mean is that we can't separate ourselves and our psychology away from the society that we have been raised in. So we need to understand these kind of historical and social constraints that we view match officials in, particularly match officials in football, because it's kind of unique. And there's a few reasons for that. And um, there's been some wonderful research, um, some of which I report in the book, um, most of which I'm indebted to a research called Dr. Tom Webb at Portsmouth University. Um, who very kindly shared some of that research and, and I, allowed me to interview him on numerous occasions for my book. Um, and, and what the research shows is that not only is this not novel, you know, referees have always been abused, um, but it also kind of like why this is the case. Um, you know, when the professionalization of the game happened, the laws of the game were codified by Cambridge old boys. There was a very sort of distinct class divide between those playing and those running the game. That divide isn't there so much now. However, there's still that kind of like historical trend um, or, or, or um, influence that that's, is still there today. So we had this kind of class dispute between the players and the officials themselves. Essentially as well, we had a lot of working class people playing the game, but also watching the game and people would put wages on, they would, they would place bets on the game. And what happens when we lose a bet? We get frustrated, particularly if we've worked really hard all week for that money. And an easy option would be to blame the officials. Um, I think one of the reasons for that is that the nature of the game of football. So if you're playing, for instance, basketball, although there's still abuse in games such as this, like one decision is less likely to have an impact on the final outcome because there are 100 points scored for either team. Uh, so many baskets uh, are going to be are going to be won and lost. Whereas in a game of football, you know, a penalty decision or a red card decision can essentially be seen as the significant decision, that sort of sliding doors moment that changed the game one way or another. So I think like the nature of the game uh, also kind of promotes this you know, view cost us the game, uh, which is interesting because I don't feel many winning teams attribute winning the game to a referee when it goes in their favour. In addition to that, we also see that referees kind of rationalise this, this trend as well, these historical and social constraints. Um, I was really fortunate to interview some elite referees, um, you know, UEFA, FIFA listed referees, people that had officiated at World Cups, European Championships, the Champions League. And, you know, one particular referee said, well, you know, when I get abuse, I just kind of think, well, they're not really yelling at me as a person, they're yelling at the uniform. It's a little bit like being a traffic warden. And although that's maybe quite a nice sort of defense mechanism and something that I'm sure is going to be sort of raised later on, what it does kind of suggest is that referees kind of rationalize that abuse to just kind of think, well, this is like part of the game, uh, which of course it doesn't have to be. And we know there's going to be significant impact. Um, some of that impact is going to be recruitment. So we know that recruitment numbers are down. We also know that retention is really hurt. So at the moment, it's only about 40% of games that require referees have them uh, in, in most leagues, particularly in the south of England. Now, 
we also know that there's another impact of, of refereeing, uh, and this kind of impacts decision-making accuracy. So the more abuse a referee gets, essentially the threshold for game management gets breached a little bit earlier. So research shows that the more kind of verbal abuse a referee gets, decision-making accuracy tends to go down as referees try to, um, although they're very well insulated from social bias, what they'll tend to do is, is think, well, I'll, I'll employ game management techniques now because if I play by the book, it's just going to kind of roll people even more and more and more. So I kind of need to balance this out and show a bit more common sense, which actually goes against what most players claim they want. And that's another story about what they claim they want and what they actually want, of course. I mentioned at the beginning, uh, and before I wrap this up, that there's a kind of a two-pronged approach to talking about referee abuse. So one would be, of course, like this historical or sociological aspect, but the other side is the psychological aspect. So referees are a very fair game because when people tend to lose games, they tend to attribute failures to things that are external, but also things that are likely to change. So although people might blame the weather, you know, Alex Ferguson famously blamed a grey kit for a loss, um, people tend to blame things that are out of their control, but they're likely to change the next time they play. So the weather might be a good example, or just a little bit of bad luck. But the referee also falls into that nice little kind of external and unstable category from a psychological perspective. There's kind of like sound psychological grounding for why a referee is kind of in the firing line. Um, so hopefully that's given you a very brief, but informative like whistle stop tour about maybe a little bit about the history of referee abuse um, about why it's been there it's not a british problem it's a worldwide problem for lots of different reasons um that are explored uh, in the book and in research and uh, it'd be interesting to hear you know maybe the views of the other uh, panelists what they what they feel are the causes of referee abuse perfect thanks Stuart. um it's really interesting before i bring in uh, trevor and and john and just get them to have a little bit of a discussion around this. Uh, we spoke at the beginning around that kind of, you, and you spoke there about controlling the controllables. Um, mm -hmm. And as referees, you know, we're looking for things that we can take away today and things that we can do. And, and we might not be able to control that person on the touchline as such, because, you know, their behavior is there. Uh, it's something that they are creating themselves. So are there things that us as referees can do, sort of simple steps that we can take either to, to, to improve situations or to um, improve how, how we are able to deal with situations as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd sort of break this into three stages. So the first stage would be things that you can do before a game. So the most important thing that we can do like before we enter the field of play would be to try to insulate ourselves as much as possible by doing two things. So one thing that we can do is to try to gain as much experience as possible. The reason that's difficult for a referee is because from a coaching perspective, uh, I have a background in it's very easy to create situations that meet the demands of the game. So coaches can replicate situations that are going to be uh, very authentic for players. Very really difficult to do that for referees. I can't get 22 people to kind of act out situations with true authenticity. And even if they were particularly good at doing it, the referee themselves knows that it's not particularly authentic. Um, so how can we do that? One, what we can do is engage in conversation. You can engage with other referees as much as possible, evenings such as this. Um, meeting up with referee associations or societies, uh, speaking to other officials is a really key um, attribute and quality of high level match officials because the more experience you can get, even if that experience is vicarious, is going to benefit you and tries to insulate you um, from these impacts, which we know is, is true from research. And the other thing we can do, and this is perhaps I'm a little bit biased, it's the area that my PhD focuses on, and this is maybe like cognitive approaches. So I would actually. Uh, stress referees practice rational thinking um so when we talk, talk about rational thinking um rather than trying to rationalize the behavior i.e well they're not really abusing me they're abusing the badge they're abusing the uniform it's part of the role you know i, I, I urge people to say you know, it's, it's like, kind of so what if, if these people are giving you verbal abuse physical abuse is obviously very different it's it's a case of what can you do to try to insulate yourself as much as possible from that um it, do we need to be uh uh, respected treated fairly all the time we'd like it but you know essentially d does it make a difference to us as an individual and i think there's some like cognitive approaches that referees can go down during the game is particularly important so during the game and this is something that i know uh, i'm doing a webinar with the whistle academy with next week i believe uh, we can talk about communication and management skills so i think that communication with officials is something that's really under researched and undervalued we tend to downplay this social element so a football referee is what's labelled as an interactor referee. It's very difficult for a football referee 
to not interact with the performers on the field of play. It's, it's just not going to happen. It's just a matter of time. So as a consequence of that, it's really important that when we communicate, we understand why and how we're communicating. And there's some really nice and significant research that I'm going to introduce on this webinar next week that looks at what we can do to communicate that it goes beyond this one sort of traditional one size fits all approach. This, you know, just maintain eye contact, stand up straight, positive body language. That these aren't valuable uh, attributes, but there's certainly more to it than that. I think uh, we can do to try to get players, uh, when I say on side, that's not to mean to appease them, but to get them to accept the decisions a little bit more readily. And then finally, I think it's really important that um, we continue to engage in conversation because referees that I've spoken to at all levels, and you know, I was talking to Craig briefly before, and since, since publishing the book, I've had the lucky opportunity to speak to over a thousand, maybe 2000 officials at all levels. And the one thing that keeps coming back, even at the highest level is this kind of feeling of loneliness. Um, particularly at grassroots level, you can you can feel very alone um, during this role. And so by speaking to other people, it's really important that we try to help insulate or overcome these elements of, of, of abuse or, or criticism that are often present and always unwelcome.